You're listening to Indications by the Conference Board. Hello, welcome to this episode of the U.S. Labor Market Roundup, our regular podcast series where we break down the monthly U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics jobs report and identify key trends in the U.S. job market that business leaders should know about. We also unpack some of the relevant policy implications for the future workforce. I'm Elizabeth Crowfoot, Senior Economist at the Committee for Economic Development of the Conference Board. Today we'll be discussing the November jobs report, as well as do a deep dive on how monthly revisions to the jobs numbers can impact our interpretation of the labor market recovery. But first, let me introduce my two regular guests and fellow labor market experts. First, Gad Levinon, head of our Labor Markets Institute and a regular contributor in Forbes. And Frank Steemers, senior economist at the conference board focusing on U.S. and global labor markets. Again, Frank, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. So this jobs report uh, had some conflicting results, and it's a reminder that the jobs and the unemployment numbers come from two separate government surveys. So let's go ahead and dig into this a little bit. Based on the survey of U.S. businesses, employers added 210,000 jobs in November, the weakest monthly job gain since the beginning of the pandemic. However, based on the survey of households, the unemployment rate fell significantly to 4.2% down from 4.6% in October. So there's a disconnect here with the anemic job gains, but a larger drop in the unemployment rate. And that's largely due to the household survey showing 1.1 million more workers in November. About 40% of these self-reported job gains were among women ages 25 to 54, many who are working moms. As school-age kids are finally able to get the vaccine, and that includes my own kids, uh, schools are going to increasingly be able to reopen and stay open, and some of those child care constraints are going to start to fade into the background. However, there's still a way to go, as women still represent 62% of total workforce exits since the start of the pandemic. We also saw a healthy uptick in labor force participation, with nearly 600,000 people entering the workforce. This is the largest inflow of workers from the sidelines in over a year. The unemployment rate for all demographic groups dropped significantly, and except for Asian workers, is less than a percentage point above pre-pandemic levels for the first time. The unemployment rate for Black workers fell by over a percentage point to 6.7% and about by half a percentage point for Hispanic workers to 5.2%. And by comparison, the rates for white and Asian workers is still below 4%. Going back to the employer survey now, showing 210,000 jobs that were added in November, job growth was strongest in professional and business services and transportation and warehousing, And we did see some jobs added in leisure and hospitality, but a paltry 23,000. Job growth has slowed substantially in this sector, averaging below 100,000 between August and November, compared to an average of well over 350,000 earlier in the spring and summer of this year. We saw job losses in November in retail trade and in state and local government. So together, just three sectors make up two thirds of total employment of the total employment deficit since the beginning of the pandemic. Leisure and hospitality represents 34 percent of all job losses, public and private education, about 20 percent and health care, 12 percent. And finally, average hourly earnings increased 4.8 percent over the past 12 months amid the highest inflation rates that we've seen in about three decades. So at about 4 million payroll jobs below pre-pandemic levels, and with an overall labor force that is still about 2 million workers short of where we were before, the pandemic remains the largest threat to a full jobs recovery. So with that set up, let's turn to our labor market experts. Uh, Frank, so when it comes to the employer survey, I think the elephant in the room is really, why is employment growth so low? And on top of that, this latest jobs report refers to the second week of November, well before Omicron was detected. What does this lower than expected payroll number and the threat of Omicron mean for the labor market outlook over the next uh, few months? Yeah, so thank you, Elizabeth. Let let me start with the latest employment number. 
I think, well, one, you already discussed it. It was a little bit difficult to interpret the number because we had these these different two surveys. But usually we, we go with the establishment survey. So this number, uh, there, there are some um, revisions to the data. Sometimes you will be talking about it later, I believe, in this podcast. But generally, that's the number that we go with. It, it was a little bit weaker. And I think that is just showing that Delta is still an issue in the economy especially if we would look at the in-person services industry, so especially leasing in hospitality. Um, when we started the reopening between April and July, about 360,000 jobs were added. I think you already mentioned that. But since August, we are having less than 100,000 jobs being added to this industry. So that really shows that Delta had its impact. Fewer consumers are going out, so businesses need fewer worker workers to work for these consumers. So I think as long as Delta is spreading, in-person services job growth will just be lower than it was um, before Delta was spreading. And then more of the job growth will be dependent on what is happening in other industries. And their job growth is actually not particularly strong. It is kind of similar as it was already before the pandemic. So that is then how you end up from an expectation of around 506,000, 600,000 jobs that um, the Bloomberg and the, Wall Street, and the Wall Street Journal consensus were before this jobs report, and you end up at about 200,000 jobs. I think it is mostly just leasing and hospitality. And as you also mentioned, education is also still a spot where job growth hasn't come back yet. So that for this jobs report, I think if we look ahead and think about the outlook, I think usually we... We try to say where the economy is going. I think this there's always uncertainty. This month, I would say it's a little bit more because we have this Om- Omicron variant. There's still a lot is unknown about it. I think compared to Delta, if it is indeed true that it would be spreading more rapidly, it could mean that, especially in in-person services, job growth will just be even more hampered compared to how it was already slowed down because of Delta. But even if it is not for Omicron, there could also be a new winter surge in Delta cases. Currently, it's still elevated, not as high in the US as it was a couple of months ago. But if you look at Europe, for example, uh, in some countries, there are now soft lockdowns, uh, not as harsh as it was in the in the time that there were no, uh, no vaccines yet. But nobody there had expected that they would, would end up with soft lockdowns. And it did happen. So even if not for Omicron, Delta could start spreading more rapidly again, again, a new uh, delay in a return to stronger job growth. So I would say like maybe if cases kind of remain similar to how it has been over the last couple of months and it doesn't really pick up, I would expect something around 400,000 jobs. That's similar to what we have seen since August, maybe a little bit stronger, maybe a little bit weaker. Um, But if Delta or especially Omicron is like really going to harm the economy, then we should maybe expect some weaker job growth going, um, yeah, going into the winter. And that's just all to say that there's a lot of uncertainty right now around this pandemic and there's, uh, you know, it could go either way. And I think it's important, you know, you mentioned that we generally go by the uh, employment numbers from the employers, right? The establishment survey is really what economists uh, hinge on when we're looking at employment growth in the economy. So I think it's important to take a look under the hood as to some of the revisions that we see. Um, and that's important because these payroll data can be subject to substantial changes over time, and it can really impact the overall employment picture as more data become available. So Just to give a little background on that, there, at least during the pandemic, all of these revisions have really made it hard to measure and to interpret the labor market. And each month's tally of jobs is revised two times. And the latest final revisions to the payroll numbers uh, for June through September actually represent the largest upward revisions to employment since 1979. So if you look at Uh, June through September initial jobs numbers, they are underestimated by a total of nearly 700,000 jobs. And by comparison, during the same period in 2019, that absolute revision was closer to 200,000. So there's a significant impact there. And typically, businesses do respond 
to the survey at a high rate and with a high degree of timeliness, but that has really fallen off uh, during the pandemic from about 75% of a collection rate pre-pandemic to 65% in the November survey. And a lot of that is due to the high pressure of the labor market that we're operating in right now and a lot of demands on the time of managers, especially of smaller firms. And some firms eventually do report, even if they are late and others may go back and revise their reports, or if they find error, errors, they'll uh, change those numbers. And these are all sources of those monthly BLS data revisions. So that's to say that what could be deemed as a disappointing payroll number today could end up looking rather upbeat later if revisions are taken into account. And of course, all of that has implications for how businesses and policymakers interpret the ongoing labor market recovery. So Gad, if I can turn to you now, you know, that recovery isn't just about jobs, um, it's also about wages. So I mentioned earlier that wages in November were up almost 5% at an annual rate and one sign of a tight labor market for sure. So how are companies dealing with labor shortages and looking ahead, what is the expected impact on wages and salaries? Thank you, Elizabeth. Your question comes at a great time because <laughs> yesterday we released the salary increase budget uh, survey results. The sa salary increase budget is kind of a proxy of the average raises that uh, workers are getting, current employees are getting in their companies. Now, um, you usually run this uh, survey in April every year, but because of the significant uh, labor shortages and wage acceleration and inflation, we uh, wanted to see how companies, uh, how, how that new information is impacting the decisions of how, how much money to put aside for uh, raises for employees. So... We ran the survey again in November, and yesterday we released the results, and the results are uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, uh, if in uh, April companies expected salary increase budget in 2022 to be 3%, the new results suggest that it will be 3.9%, so a very big jump, and the 3.9% is the highest since 2008. So. The entire decade before the pandemic, uh, we kind of were stuck at around 3%. Even the severe labor shortages around 2018, 2019 uh, didn't uh, move the salary increase budget much. But now uh, companies broke this psychological barrier of 3% and are moving to uh, 4%. And uh, it seems that, of course, the, the very fast uh, wage growth for the new hires is impacting uh, the, the raises that companies are giving to their workers, but inflation is also a factor. So inflation was probably not really an issue in terms of uh, wage determinations for several decades, but now with inflation going up 5-6%, uh, it is becoming a factor and uh, the cost of living adjustment is, uh, is making a comeback. And we had almost 40% of the respondents to our survey said that the increase in inflation played a role in their increase of uh, salary increase budgets. So I think uh, what that means, uh, kind of looking into 2022, is that we should expect wage growth to remain strong, uh, not just because of new hires getting, uh, continuing to get uh, significant uh, wage increases because of the ongoing labor shortages, but also current employees who do not switch jobs and stay in their jobs are also going to see fast wage growth. Yeah, that's uh, great to hear, especially you've mentioned in previous podcast episodes about that wage compression dynamic and that could potentially make current employees, you know, a bit disgruntled if they know that, you know, new employees are are, are getting higher wages because of the demand and the labor shortages. It sort of evens the playing field a little bit with these uh, salary increase budgets also rising. 
So those are some really good insights for today, and I think this is a great place to leave it. So I've been speaking with Gad Lebanon and Frank Steemers from the Conference Board Labor Markets Institute about the main insights from the November jobs report. Again, Frank, thanks again for joining me. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. And thanks for all of our audience for listening. Please join us for the next U.S. Labor Markets Roundup as we discuss the December jobs report. Don't forget to subscribe to both the Indications and Sustaining Capitalism podcast series from the Conference Board through your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for listening. I'm Elizabeth Crowfoot with the Committee for Economic Development of the Conference Board. This has been Indications from the Conference Board.